question uh, after the talks. And I want to let you know that all the hosts here are also trainees in School of Biological Sciences. Okay. Uh, so without further ado, I'll just pass it to our first host, Maggie. Hello, everyone. Um, I am pleased to introduce my lab mate and mentor, Mishwa. Meshwe <laughs> Duan. <laughs> um, she's in her final year of her PhD in Dr. Gregory Gibson's lab, and she's originally from Chengdu, China. Uh, she came to Georgia Tech originally as a master's in bioinformatics, and she loved it here so much that she wanted to pursue her PhD. She works with immunologist Dr. Um, Anyang Li over at Emory, along with Dr. Ignacio Sanz. And she works on deciphering short and long-lived plasma cell survival for the basis of effective immunity using single-cell transcriptome bank analysis, and she'll be sharing that today. So please give me a warm welcome in introducing Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Sure. Hi, everyone. So I'm Michelle Duan. Yeah, I'm from Greg Gibson's lab. Um, today, I'm going to share some of the results from my single cell study, uh, which shows the distinct TNF signaling pathways in human bone marrow long lived plasma cell maturation. Today I will, so first of all, I will give a brief view of today's talk. First of all, I will give a short introduction to the what are non-live plasma cells, then how heterogeneous are human bone marrow, bone marrow plasma cells, and what pathways and genes distinguish different maturation paths, how survival genes are expressed in those bone marrow plasma cell subgroups, and uh, finally, a uh, very short summary. First of all, I will give a short introduction to what are long-lived plasma cells. So from Only's lab in 2015, they published a paper and find that the long-lived plasma cells are contained with CD19 negative, CD38 high, and CD138 positive cell populations. They use the cell surface protein CD19, CD38, CD138 to subgroup the antibody sequencing cells, and they use the number 235 uh, and the character ABD to distinguish those subgroups from the peripheral blood and the bone marrows. Sorry. Yeah, it has to be there. Yeah, yeah I think. Can I close it first and then open it after the presentation? Maybe here, yeah, here we go. All right. Um, so in that study, they did some tenderness specific antigen detection, missile and mumps specific antigen detection, as well as the flu uh, specific antigen detection. So all the those subjects recruited for this study, they received the, the flu vaccine one to 11 months before they give the bone marrow aspirates. And you can see that for those subjects which, can you see, yeah. Uh, which recruit the two uh, shows the higher like the serum titers for the tenderness and the meso mumps specific uh, antibodies. Actually, they didn't receive the vaccine. They don't have any history of the MR, MR vaccine, but all those antibodies are from their childhood infections. So you can see that even after tens of years, Within the PubD cell populations, they still can detect some specific the antibodies. So from this study, um, the, the summary is like the non lived plasma cell can exist for a lifetime, which contained in PubD cells, and the secret high affinity antibodies that maintain steady state Ig secretion in the absence of the antigen. Then I'm gonna talk about how heterogeneous are human bone marrow plasma cells. To answer this question, we did the single cell study and all these like the library preparation, cell fact sorting stuff are done by CDSCNA. And first of all, we recruit five healthy, we get 
five healthy bone marrow aspirate, and we use the previous de defined the cell surface markers to sort our population cell, our targeted cell populations, pub A, pub B, and pub D. And we use the tenex genomics to build the libraries for the single cell RNA and the single cell VDJ uh, libraries and the synod for the sequencing. After the very careful the QC step and the test for the cluster stability, finally we discovered the 15 subgroups of the bone marrow plasma cells. Um, all those 15 all those 15 clusters we detected in all five subjects. And uh, for those past clusters, we always can detect uh, some markers to represent uh, the cell population. And here, I just want to mention that for the cluster one, which has the high, highest expression of the MK37 and the CD43, which is encoded by the SPN these genes. And uh, this, the uh, marker gene expression is consistent with previous defined the plasma blast cell population. And the, except uh, for the cluster four, we only detect uh, some uh, immunoglobulin genes highly expressed in this cell population. No other informative genes is highly expressed. So we think the cluster four should be like the intermediate stage of the plasma cell maturation. And here after, uh, we will call the cell cluster from one to four at the early plasma, early stage of the plasma cell maturation, while five, six, seven, eight as the late plasma cell maturation. The cluster nine and 10, because they show the uh, interference gene signatures, and we call them as the interferon responsive cell population. Cluster 11 shows the higher um, percentage of the mitochondria encoded the mitochondria transcript, and we call it the mitochondria cell population. Cluster 13, 14, and 15, which has a higher proportion of the IgM isotype cell population, and we call them the IgM population, which I will show more details in the following slides. Um, first of all, we uh, show some of the uh, representative gene expression in the current cell clusters. MK67 high, high, highest expressed in the plasma blast cell population. Then the CD19 uh, gene expression we see is mostly expressed at the bottom of this AAC island, while CD138 genes shows the highest gene expression in the top of this island. These two um, known like the transcript factors which are very important for the plasma cell maturation, we see the XBP1 shows a very stable gene expression during the whole maturation process, while the BNIMP1, which is encoded by the PRDM1, which shows the higher expression in the early phase and maybe and a slightly higher gene expression in this part while decreased the gene expression in this group of cells. And we count the proportion of the fact sorted cell labels in the current cell clusters. We see the early phase of the plasma cells has a higher proportion of the pop A and pop B cell population, while late phase of the plasma cell is mostly combined uh, from the pop B and pop D cell population. Similar trend we see for the IgM dominant cell population. What's interesting is there is, we still see there are some small proportion of the IgA cell population located in the late phase of the plasma cell. Actually, when we um, uh, show the gene expression, we see this group of the pop A actually transcription, they, they already resemble pop B cells as CD138 uh, encoded, no, the SDC1, which encoded the CD138 shows the uh, intermediate gene expression. So the current assumption uh, from our lab is like, if the plasma cell wants to become as the non live plasma cell, first of all, they need to exit the cell cycle process and start maturation like to the uh, non live plasma cell, as well as during the process, they should diminish the uh, B cell phenotypes. So here we show the gene expression for the uh, DBTB32, the inhibitor of the MHC class two uh, gene, and the LYN, the inhibitor of the BCR gene. So we see these inhibitor genes highly expressed in the early phase, as well as the MHC class two highly expressed in the early phase of the plasma cell maturation. While there is an uh, exemption, which is HLA DOB, which increased the gene expression during the plasma cell maturation. 
Actually, the previous publication shows that this gene is not regulated by the C2TA, which is the main transcription factor that regulates the gene expression of the MHC class 2. So this key map is from the bulk iron sick data, which is generated from the in vitro cell culture, and uh, all this data is generated by Lay from Unflab. And uh, she um, used some blood, unlimited ALC, put into our cell culture median. And uh, from each time point, you can see like the same time point. So she um, saw some of cells and uh, do the bulk iron sequencing. You can see the gene expression actually, I think, match quite well uh, with the single cell observed uh, expression pattern. This is the uh, summary from the VDJ analysis, and we count the fraction of the isotypes in current cell uh, clusters. So we found that the majority of the bromeroplasma cells are IgG1 dominant cell populations. While cluster 13 to 15, we see there has a higher proportion of the plasma cells contain the IgM isotype. That's why we call it the IgM. Uh, dominant cell populations. And then we use other genes like the CD19, B220 to help us characterize the progenitor of those um, two dominant lineages. And uh, in the previous publication, it shows that the B220 has a higher expression in the newly formed bromeroplasma cells. That's why we see, we, all, we like label like the cluster one, two, three, four as the early phase of the plasma cell maturation as well as the cluster 13, we think it should be like the progenitor cells for the IgM's dominant cell population. And the, the J chain, as expected, has higher expression in the IgM dominant cell populations. So um, the current well known accepted like assumption for the non live plasma cell is the plasma cell generated from the germinal center, they are more likely migrate into the bone marrow and uh, uh, become as the non live plasma cells. So the germinal center derived the plasma cells, they are class switched, they have higher hypermutations, somatic hypermutations. That's why we checked if we can, uh, by characterizing the mutation frequency in the current cell clusters to help, help us distinguish like the uh, early phase of the plasma cells versus late phase plas of the plasma cells. So the NB cell population is the naive B cell population, which we used as the control to compare with the plasma cells. So you can see naive B cells compared with plasma cells has a really low mutation frequency. And uh, the cluster six, no matter when we count the global V region mutation frequency or by the CDR region, by FR region, we always see cluster six has the average higher mutation frequency than any other cell populations. And we did the permutation test uh, to validate actually cluster six has significantly higher mutation frequencies. So this is one characteristic we need to keep in mind. And the other, so in each cell cluster, we also uh, calculate the mutation frequency by the isotypes IgG, A, I, I, IgG, IgA, and IgM. So for the IgG and the IgA, we see very similar mutation frequency, but they are significantly higher than the IgM cell populations. Next, I'm gonna talk about what pathways in the genes distinguish different maturation path. So by the trajectory analysis, we predicted four paths of the maturations. Path one is from the cluster per PB stage to the cluster six, highest mutation frequency. Path two is to cluster seven and eight. Path three is to the interferon positive. Path two is to the mitochondria population. And we want to know what kind of pathways can distinguish those four paths those four maturation paths. So we did the enrichment score using the current hallmark, 15 hallmark pathways from the GSEA database. And uh, we projected the enrichment score on the current UMAP, so you give you a more intuitive way like on like how the 
pathway enrichment score changes during the maturation. Uh, this fitting us shows the uh, trend of those enrichment score in four paths. So what I want to highlight here is, so you can see most of the pathways decrease the enrichment score from the early to late phase uh, maturation, while we see the TNF alpha single learning uh, kappa B pathways shows a really increase in our past two while, you know, keep like the very stable enrichment in other three paths. So we want to know, so first of all, we want to know if what we observed the enrichment is by any like the donor bias expression or the outer large expression. So we check like the enrichment score in all five individuals. Then we see the, the enrichment score decreased in the cluster six while in increase in the cluster seven. And the gene expression shows the general like the decreased gene expression in the cluster six while increase the gene expression in the cluster seven. So the TNF alpha single only NF kappa B this pathway really help us di distinguish those two paths which contain the might contain the long lived plasma cells. And uh, to further uh, characterize like those two paths, what kind of genes can help us distinguish them. So we see there are um, 80, in total 80 genes that are specifically upregulated in the past two, cluster seven, and uh, which include the Jun, Jun B, Force, Force B, MCL1, BCL2. Uh, NF kappa B I A for those genes. While in the cluster six, which is in path one, we see the CD138, CD9, CD33 highly expressed in the path one cell clusters. And this is from the 2021's review paper. So it shows that, well, so the um, NF kappa B I A, TF, TNF, AIP3, these genes are, you know, highly expressed when the NF kappa B pathway being activated. And also, if kappa B pathway activation is not just solely being activated, we were combined with several, some other pathways like the June K, JK, P38, which can also upregulate the gene expression of the June false and the June D, those genes. So next I will show the survival gene expression in the current plasma cell subgroups. Um, so I will give you, so this uh, review paper shows that, so generally like the image M MCL1, BCL2 is the pro-survival pro genes, but the beam is the, the activator of the apoptosis. If the pro-apoptotic genes has higher expression than the pro-survival genes, the, this cell population is more likely will prime for apoptosis, but there is another cell population called the apoptosis refractory cell population, which is doesn't have the, you know, the poor forming genes, which is the back and the back, backs and the back one. So this cell population, no matter like how high the pro apoptotic gene expressed, they are not likely to uh, prime for apoptosis. So here is the genes from the BCL2 family, and uh, I group them as the pro-survival, pro-apoptotic, uh, extrinsic or pro-apoptotic, and the cell cycle rest gene expression. So what I want to highlight here is the, for the MCL1, PCL2, you see the gene expression decrease in the path one cluster six while increase in the path two cluster six and seven. But for the cluster 12, which really capture eyes, has the highest expression of the pro-survival genes as well as the highest genes expression of the intrinsic pro-apoptotic genes. And we think this cell population is very stressful for plasma cells and might prime for apoptosis. And this is some um, like the um, uh, gene expression trend in the current four path. So the MCO one really distinguish like the path one from the path two. So in the path one, the MCO one gene expression decreased in the late phase while it keeps going up in the path two. So the plasma cells, you know, mm, as I showed before, so although the path one decreased the MCO 
one BCL2, but it has the highest expression of the CD138. So we are wondering if the non native plasma cell can uh, use some other, like the pro survivor genes, to help them to be non native plasma cells. So these figures shows uh, uh, from the VDJ data analysis, just basically want to show you, yeah, we have some from the VDJ analysis, we do observe that some um, clones, mainly located in the early phase and some start from the transition and to the late phase and some in the late phase. And there is one clone start at the very beginning and mature to the late phase to support our like inferred trajectories of the plasma cell. And from this circus plot, you can see that the, uh, um, the each clone is colored by the most matured cell populations. So you can see within the early phase, you can you will have higher clones that colored by the early phase cell clusters. While there are still a, a small fraction of cell population or clones, they can further mature into the late phase. Mercida index also shows that the cluster one, two, three, early phase, we see the higher connectivity and the similarity. Late phase five, six, seven also shows a higher connectivity and the uh, similarity. So in summary, as like the human bone marrow cells are very heterogeneous and can be represented by different of the cell markers. And the human bone marrow plasma cells, they uh, IgG1 dominant as well as the IgM dominant cell population. So Ig, uh, human bone marrow plasma cells may have different progenitor cells parity review the plasma cell pool as I showed in like from the uh, VDJ results and the gene expression. And uh, we infer the several maturation path for the human bone marrow plasma cell maturation. And the non native plasma cells are also very heterogeneous and can use maybe different survival factors to m promote its survival. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for my collaborators. I know we're over time a little bit, but if anybody has questions for Michelle. Chat. Some messages on the chat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I will pass it on. Okay, we'll pass it on. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, can everyone hear me? All right, it's my pleasure to introduce Zach today. He's a postdoctoral fellow in the Streelman Lab here at Georgia Tech. He earned his PhD at Emory University where he studied the neuroscience of constellation behaviors in bulls and other rodents. And here at Georgia Tech, he continues to, dis to study behavioral neuroscience using cutting edge tools and techniques. Um, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Zach. All right, thank you, George, and thanks everyone for coming, and thanks, Dr. Han, for organizing this. Um, I'll get right into it. I am really interested in how natural genetic variation and um, the brain coordinate the incredible diversity of social behavior that we see in nature and also variation in social cognition and behavior um, that exists across humans. Um, but one of the major challenges uh, for behavioral neuroscience ever since its inception 
um, is the incredible complexity of the brain and also the incredible complexity of the genome, but I'm going to focus on the brain today. And uh, one of the uh, major hurdles that has always faced behavioral neuroscience is sifting through um, this haystack to find the important needles. And that's really difficult. And, um, you know, what the whole field has kind of adjusted around that challenge and has converged on model organisms and pretty expensive, laborious uh, experiments uh, that require a lot of time um, and usually teach us a lot about only one cell population or molecular signaling system at a time. Um, so I'm going to talk about how I'm tackling this challenge in uh, Lake Malawi cichlids. Uh, you may be familiar with these fishes. They're a really um, amazing and powerful comparative model for understanding the genetic basis of complex traits. They've explosively radiated into thousands of species over a relatively short evolutionary time span. Um, they're phenotypically di diverse, but I'm really interested in their behavioral diversity, um, and they're genetically uh, not much more different. Species are not much more different than individual humans on average. And um, they, because of that genetic similarity, they can be hybridized, and uh, really powerful experimental genetic mapping approaches can be applied. Um, today I'm going to talk about a behavior that's called castle building, which um, is a really interesting behavior in Lake Malawi where males during the breeding season will construct large underwater courtship structures out of sand. And they spend a lot of uh, time and energy doing this. And the lab has previously uh, traced uh, species variation in bower construction behaviors like castle building to uh, a region of the genome. So castle building has a genetic basis. Um, and we can try to understand how genes in the brain are coordinating this behavior. Um, but in order to study this behavior systematically in the lab, you, uh, you have to have a system for measuring it. And I spent the first few years of my postdoc uh, doing this. It's not trivial to establish a new uh, behavioral neuroscience system in, in the laboratory, um, a new species and a new behavior. Um, so I won't get into it, but our system works with a Raspberry Pi, a depth sensor um, that tracks the structure and action recognition, uh, a machine learning approach for video data that's able to pick up many different uh, building, quivering, and other be uh, feeding behaviors. Um, and so we run this system, uh, you know, 24-7, and we're able to get a lot of information about what uh, these fish are doing. This is really important because bower construction is um, uh, expressed over long time periods, and so you kind of have to follow these fish as they naturally express the behavior. Uh, it's unlike a lot of behaviors where you can introduce an animal and it will just perform the behavior right away, or you can um, inject it with something to trigger the behavior. So um, I'm going to tell you about the experiment that I've been working on to uh, understand the neural basis of bower construction. And I have to say that I've worked with amazing graduate students, George Gruenhagen and Brianna Hegarty, who's not here right now, but, um, you know, none of this work could really happen uh, without uh, the a whole effort from, from our team, and it's really fun working with them. So we monitor these fish downstairs in this building, and uh, they're allowed to freely behave and interact with sand and females. and um, Eventually, males will start performing this behavior, and when they do, as long as it's within a certain time window during the day, uh, I go down there and I microdissect uh, the building males, telencephalon, and also a neighboring male who is not building um, telencephalon. And uh, we run it through the, a single nuclei isolation protocol that we've optimized, and uh, we sequence the RNA from the nucleus, not the cells, on the 10x platform. Um, the behavioral data looks really good. Uh, when we go back and ask, um, we, you know, after we, after we collect the brains, we can analyze the 
10 hour videos and uh, the depth data and see that all of the building mails that we collected were building and um, uh, we can see that in terms of both the predicted build events from action recognition in yellow here, and also um, from the depth change uh, analysis of our, uh, that's generated by our depth sensor. And before I go on, I just want to say that we also know that um, building males, you know, a lot of behaviors in nature are complicated and co-vary with physiology and, and other behaviors, and that's the case with bower construction too. So these are relevant biological factors that we need to pay attention to if we really want to understand the neural basis of castle building. So building males are also performing more quivering behaviors, and they also tend to have a, a greater relative gonadal mass compared to control males. Um, so when we get the data back from 10x, um, we need to make some sense of it. I'll kind of uh, go fast through this because I know um, these, we don't have a lot of time. Um, we, we cluster the data, so uh, we use global transcriptional profiles which separate our cells into uh, clusters. We can also track canonical markers of core cell types that populate all neural tissue and see that these cell types nicely segregate across our clusters. We can also identify um, novel genes that are exclusively expressed in specific clusters. And this is um, my favorite uh, way of understanding clusters. And this effort, uh, this has been an amazing effort by Brianna Hegarty who has gone really deep through hundreds of papers uh, in Telios identifying um, which uh, genes out of a long curated list um, that we had show uh, conserved expression patterns in cichlids and other telios species in specific brain regions. So these are genes that um, we know about their molecular function, we know about their behavioral relevance in many cases, and we also know where they're expressed in the brain. They also exhibit biased expression patterns across our clusters. So we can get a really multi-dimensional biological understanding of what our clusters are. And um, then uh, that is a nice foundation for starting to probe how do these clusters alter their function during behavior. Um, so one of the classic tools in behavioral neuroscience for doing this is um, tracking IEG expression. Um, and yeah, Michelle, you may notice that many of these genes are a lot, uh, overlap with uh, many of the genes that you just showed. Um, so in neurons, depolarization triggers uh, uh, transcription of immediate early genes, and um, they can be used then in the brain to track which populations are selectively activated in response to a stimulus or during a certain context or during performance of a specific behavior. And so uh, I won't get into it, but uh, these genes are actually kind of hard to track in neurons. And um, so I developed a, an approach to identify a module of these genes that strongly co-vary with one another across cells and in do, across different clusters and cell populations. And in doing so, um, I think I've identified uh, seven genes whose um, immediate early gene-like function has not been uh, described before. That's pretty exciting. So we're going to follow these genes um, in the brain in association with building to identify potential cell populations that are activated during building. Um, and so we actually see one population, 9-glute, that shows a signature of activation. Um, we use a pretty strict modeling approach, uh, and we also account for variance that's explained by quivering and gonadal physiology. And we see that distinct subsets of cell populations are showing signatures of neuronal activation in association with these different biological factors. Um, another way of probing the behavior associated function of our clusters is using unbiased uh, differential gene expression analysis. And um, long story short, we again see distinct subsets of cell populations that show a disproportionately large number of differentially expressed genes in, associated with, in association with building, quivering, and gonadal physiology. 
And we also see that nine glute, which was our only population at the, at the uh, clustering level um, that showed a signature of neuronal activation also shows a disproportionately large number of differentially expressed genes. Um, so multiple converging lines of evidence on that population and its uh, importance for Bauer construction. We can ask about what these genes uh, that are differentially expressed in the, in the brain in association with building and quivering and gonadal physiology are doing. Um, and uh, we see many uh, biological categories that are enriched and many of the same categories are enriched um, among DEGs that are associated with building, quivering, and gonadal physiology. So it seems like similar biological processes are being recruited in distinct cell populations in association with gonadal physiology and with multiple different behaviors. Um, so I'm just gonna, I don't have a lot of time. There's a lot of interesting things to talk about, but I wanna talk um, about one follow-up that we're doing um, or that we've done on neurogenesis, which is one of our biggest hit categories for differentially expressed genes. And um, we have followed up on this in two ways. The first is, um, well, neurogenesis is really interesting because this is a mechanism that's been shown to be really important for behavior in uh, mammals and fish across vertebrates. And um, it's also something that in humans um, slows down a lot as we age and in adults is really limited in the brain. Um, and so uh, you can see there's actually many cell populations that are showing um, well, sorry, what you're looking at here is uh, enrichment for behavior or gonadal associated expression of 88 conserved genes with an annotated go function of positively regulating neurogenesis across vertebrates. So same go annotation in mice and zebrafish. And um, we see that a huge number of clusters um, show uh, increased transcription of these genes in, associated, in association with building in a few clusters in association with gonadal physiology. Um, and again, we see nine glute, so, um, which is the uh, cell population um, that sh also showed signatures of neuronal activation and differential gene expression, um, or disproportionately large number of uh, building associated uh, differentially expressed genes. So now three converging lines of evidence for that cell population and its importance for um, building behavior. Um, so we also happen to know a lot about the process of neurogenesis in the brain, and we know that new neurons are being generated from radial glial cells in the telencephalon, and radial glial cells are localized to one cluster in our data. And we can ask, um, about what that cluster looks like in behaving versus controlled males. And there's a classic signature of the um, transition of radial glial cells um, from quiescence to activation. Um, so radial glial cells, they stay dormant and quiescent and then become activated and start generating progenitor uh, cells, which can differentiate into many different types of neurons in the telencephalon. And this transition, in fish is marked by transcription of aromatase, or CYP19A1. And we see a really strong and building associated signature of activation of radial glial cells in association with building behavior. And um, we can even trace this signature down to specific subpopulations. And there's a lot of interesting things going on in radial glial cells that I can't get into, but um, the aromatase signal specifically um, traces to this pop subpopulation in, in green when we recluster them. And this is a subpopulation that is marked specifically by expression of the transcription factor LHX5, which uh, in mammals, mice, plays an important role in hippocampal neurogenesis. Um, so in summary, I hope that I have uh, 
convinced you that single cell omics technologies, I think, are really disproportionately um, transforming neuroscience, uh, especially uh, because such a big problem for the field has been the heterogeneity of these cells that are all interspersed. It's very difficult, and no tool like has ever allowed tracking the function of so many cell populations simultaneously in a single um, animal. And um, uh, so I've shown you that um, specific populations exhibit transcriptional signatures of neuronal activation in association with building, and um, specific populations also exhibit signatures of um, neurogenesis, both neuronal and non-neuronal populations. And with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Han for organizing, Brianna and George, amazing teammates, Todd and Patrick McGrath for mentorship, uh, funding agencies and the cores that have helped us along the way, and uh, happy to take questions. Thanks, Zach. Do we have any questions? Yeah. I'll start here. Hey, Zach. Very interesting talk. Thank you. I found your um, data related to radioglycerol and the neurogenesis very interesting. I'm just wondering, is there evidence to suggest that uh, uh, neurogenesis, adult neurogenesis, is required for the castle building behavior? There's no evidence of that yet. Honestly, um, there's not a whole lot known about the neuroscience of castle building behavior in general. It's almost like um, we're entering this system largely from scratch. And um, this is like our first pass um, blast at the brain and understanding the um, like the neuronal functional basis of castle building. Yeah, so no manipulative experiments have been done. And um, there was uh, a single other uh, experiment using whole brain RNA-seq in a small number of animals has looked at um, bower construction. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think it would be a really cool whole line of follow-up studies that uh, the data all kind of points towards neurogenesis uh, if you just follow blindly. Zach, uh, congratulations on this. This has really moved along beautifully in the last few months. Um, so, and I thought that the partitioning of the gonadal signaling and the quivering and the bower was just really special. Mm -hmm. um, so two questions related to that. So one biological is, what are your thinking as to why there's a relationship between gonadal mass and neuronal expression? And second one is, methodologically, were you using mass, or what were you doing to do that partitioning and separating it? Yeah, um, I will, so the first question, um, what do I think is happening with, uh, like, gonadal? I, I, are you, I assume maybe the neuronal activation signatures, for example. That's one of the most um, non-intuitive ones, I think. Uh, and what I think is happening is that, um, so I think that during building, males are, their gonads tend to be larger, and they're releasing tes more testosterone which is being converted into estradiol by aromatase in radial glial cells. Estradiol can permeate, since it's a steroid hormone, it can permeate the cell membrane and kind of go to outside cell populations where it has been shown to um, prime neurons and increase their likelihood of firing. So I think that that's what the gonadal effect is likely. It's like a priming of uh, many neuronal populations that may be important and involved in the circuitry of mating behaviors and other behaviors that are linked to the gonadal physiology changes. And then how am I doing it? Um, basically, I'm using a, a sequence of linear mixed effects models where I allow, it's not a lasso approach, but it's just a mixed model approach where I use like six different models and allow the variables to compete against one another in all possible pairwise combinations, and then I identify the effects that are significant in every single model. Um, so the building effect is significant regardless of whether 
It's analyzed as a binary variable, building or not, or a continuous variable based on their level of activity. And when it's uh, competing against gonadal uh, physiology to explain variance, when it's competing against quivering, and when it's competing against both simultaneously. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. I think that's all the time we have for questions. And we can move on to the next speaker. Thanks, George. Hello, is this on? Okay, good. Um, I'll just introduce Brett while he's uh, getting set up. Um, I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Brett Alio. He's a postdoctoral, NSF postdoctoral fellow um, in the uh, Sponberg lab. Um, and he's done a lot of great work uh, studying the evolution of strategies of flight in moths and the evolution of wing shape. Um, he got his PhD at the University of Chicago in the Department of Evolutionary, uh, in the Department of Organismal and uh, Biology and Anatomy with Melina Hale. And uh, today he'll be talking about the evolution of blinking in mudskippers and tetrapods. Thank you, Ethan. I appreciate the kind introduction, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk to everybody about blinking. And I truly think blinking is one of the most underappreciated behaviors that a lot of us take for granted. And over the course of this talk, everybody in this room is going to blink on average once every five seconds, which is about 12 times a minute. But now that I mentioned that, some people in this room are probably blinking a lot more. Other people in this room are probably trying to hold back from blinking. If you're in that second group that are trying to hold back from blinking, stop doing that. Blinking is critical for maintaining eye health and epithelial cell function. And in many extant tetrapods, blinking serves multiple functions. One of these is eye wetting or maintaining a film of fluid over the cornea, which is again important for epithelial cell health and oxygenation of those cells. And another is cleaning the eye of debris, which can be critical to maintain visual acuity and limit damage. And blinking can also function to protect the eye from foreign objects that could scratch or puncture the cornea. And finally, blinking invertebrates can serve as a way to communicate or interact socially with conspecifics, which is a behavior that we humans use pretty regularly and has even been discussed by Darwin in some of his writings. But since the origin of this novel multifunctional behavior, blinking and its associated morphology has diversified incredibly across tetrapods. For example, in humans, eye closure is accomplished by lowering the upper eyelid downward, where in some turtles, it's actually the lower eyelid that is raised to accomplish eye closure. And in many species of amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, a third membrane, the translucent nictitating membrane, has evolved as a way to serve these exact same functions while allowing the maintenance of some visual acuity because of its translucentness. However, hypotheses of how and why this behavior originated in early tetrapods are almost non-existent. We believe that blinking has only evolved once in tetrapods and that the evolution of terrestriality in vertebrates is a strong selective pressure driving the evolution of this behavior. And we have several lines of evidence to support this hypothesis. First, to our knowledge, most fish do not exhibit a blinking behavior. Although blinking has evolved in some shark species, and it's believed to act as a way to protect the eye as sharks are attacking their prey. A second line of evidence is that in species of reptiles and amphibians that have evolved, second, that have secondarily evolved to be fully aquatic, they've re-entered the water full time, 
in all of these lineages, like the species of frog on the right, blinking has been repeatedly lost when these lineages reinvade the water full time. And the third piece of evidence is that the mudskippers are a second lineage of Actinopterygian fish, this time, the second lineage of fishes, this time within the Actinopterygians, that have also evolved to spend the majority of their day on land. And similarly, mudskippers have convergently and independently evolved the same blinking behavior. So at this point, we know mudskipper blinking is phenomenologically analogous to blinking in tetrapods, but is this behavior actually convergent? So to support a hypothesis of convergence, we need to know how and why blinking has evolved in mudskippers, and for the remainder of the talk, we're going to do just that. So first, we're going to focus on the kinematics and movement of the eye, and then we're going to take a deeper dive into the associated morphology to see if any morphological adaptations have evolved in tandem with this behavior that could be facilitating these eye movements. Next, we'll focus on determining the functions of blinking in mudskippers. And based on what we know about blinking in humans, we're going to specifically test the hypotheses that in mudskippers, blinking functions to wet the eye in the corneal surface, clean the eye of, from foreign debris, and finally, protect the eye from puncture by foreign objects. And before we continue, I want to recognize the amazing group of undergraduates that I've had the privilege to work with over the last three and a half years. And these are the people that have conducted much of the work that you're about to see through their experience in the multi-semester vertically integrated project course here at Georgia Tech, where we're integrating these authentic research experiences directly into the curriculum. And this is this amazing innovative educational activity that I think really reduces the barriers for undergraduates seeking research experience at Georgia Tech. And, and, and I'm always so impressed by what comes out of these courses. So over the last three and a half years through this project and others, over a quarter of the students that have participated in this class are now either are now on published products, which I think is absolutely wicked cool. So let's dive into the how. The first thing we did was we examined the kinematics of mudskipper blinking, the motion of the eye and the associated apparatus that's responsible for blinking in the mudskipper. And as we can see by looking at the blue traces in this figure, mudskipper blinking is achieved by the ventral retraction or the depression of the eye downward into the orbit. And as the eye moves downward, a membrane below the eye, known as the nictitating membrane, is displaced laterally and dorsally as this behavior happens to completely cover the globe of the eye. And to investigate how this behavior is accomplished and whether any new musculature has evolved or any new glands or secretory cells have evolved in tandem, we conducted contrast-enhanced CT scanning of the soft tissue of the eye apparatus, and we find that mudskippers have not evolved any new musculature to accomplish this behavior, and they rely on some combination of their six extraocular eye muscles, those six extraocular eye muscles that are well conser conserved across vertebrates and are the same muscles that you're using right now, for example, if you were rolling your eyes at me during this behavior, or during this presentation, rather. So next, we further analyzed the scan, and we determined that mudskippers have not evolved any tear glands that could be analogous to the lacrimal or memobian glands of humans and other vertebrates. And we also confirmed this through histological staining and imaging of several areas around the eye and other parts of the body, and again found no evidence of glands or a high concentration of secretory cells around the eye. We did find the presence of mucus secreting goblet cells, which are those highlighted on the bottom right of this histological section and indicated by the red arrows, but they aren't in any higher concentration here than they are in any other part of the body. So we find that in mudskippers, blinking is achieved through the ventral retraction of the eye into the orbit where it's passively covered by a ventrally located membrane. And this demonstrates that an incredibly complex behavior can evolve in systems with rudimentary morphology and suggest that few morphological changes or specializations are needed to occur for this behavior to actually evolve. So while we've gained insight into the mechanics of the blinking behavior and the associated morphology that facilitates this, we don't yet know the functional roles blinking plays in mudskippers and whether it serves some of the same purposes as it does in other tetrapod systems. So the next question that we wanted to ask was, does blinking function to wet the eye? 
So to do this, our team created an experimental chamber that was equipped with a computer fan at the top of the chamber and a small pool of water at the bottom of the tank. And mudskippers were left in the tank for a total of two hours. For one of the hours, the fans were off. And for one of the hours, the fans were turned on. And we calculated that turning on the fans increased the evaporation rate of a thin fluid film by approximately 20 times. And to ensure that the length of the experiment didn't impact our results, we alternated whether we turned the fans on for the first or the second half of these experiments. We then reviewed the film to identify the timestamps of each blink throughout the test period, and we calculated the inter-blink interval which is the duration of time between two consecutive blinks. And then we compared that between our two conditions, fans on, or our high evaporation condition, and fans off, which we'll call our control condition. And we would predict that an increase in evaporation rate within the chamber should increase blink rate and therefore decrease the interblink interval. And that's exactly what we see. We found that the inner blink interval is significantly shorter in high evaporation conditions. So mudskipper blink rate goes from about one blink every two minutes in control conditions to two blinks in a single minute under high evaporation conditions. So together, these data support the hypothesis that one function of mudskipper blinking is to wet the eye. The next thing we wanted to test was whether another function of blinking is to clean the eye. This is important because mudskippers, as you may have guessed from the name, they love the mud. And keeping the eye clean is critical for maintaining visual acuity, for locating predators, prey, and conspecifics. So to test this hypothesis, we conducted a very simple experiment. We, we sprinkled as many brine shrimp eggs as we could over the, surface, over the corneal surface. We chose brine shrimp eggs because they're approximately 200 microns in diameter, which is within the size range of the sand and dirt particles found in waterfront environments and is a completely harmless foreign particle for the mudskippers. And then we waited for the mudskipper to blink. And then when we reviewed the videos of these experiments to calculate the number of egg particles covering the corneal surface both before and after a blink. And when we consider all of the blinks we recorded, we find that a single blink is highly effective at cleaning the corneal surface, and in most cases, could completely clean the eye surface of all of its foreign debris. So we can now also support our second hypothesis that another function of blinking in mudskippers is to clean the eye. A third functional hypothesis that we wanted to test was that blinking can also serve to protect the eye from foreign objects that may actually act to puncture the eye. So to do this, we cr created a capacitance sensor, like one that you would find in the screen of your, your, a touch screen on your iPhone or some other type of phone or sur pad surface. And when that sensor touched a conductive surface, like the body of an animal or the eye of a mudskipper, it would illuminate a small LED, which we also kept, our, which we also kept in view. And we filmed ourselves using a high-speed camera, lightly tapping the upper corneal surface of the eye which would reliably trigger a blink every single tap. But we wanted to take this a step further. We wanted to determine if this behavior could actually be a reflex. So from these videos, we calculated two variables. The first variable was the lag time between when the eye was actually tapped and when the blink was initiated. And next was the duration or the speed of the eye closing period, which is the duration it takes the eye to be fully depressed during a blink cycle. And these metrics, lag time and depression duration, have been measured for the corneal reflexes in humans, which is the only other system we found data to compare this to. So we can now compare these data between mudskippers and humans to see if the temporal patterns of mechanically stimulated blinks in mudskippers are similar to those uh, reflexive blinks in humans. And what we find is that the lag time averages just under 30 milliseconds in mudskippers. And this is very similar to the lag time of the corneal reflex in humans. We see a similar average and we see a similar degree of variability within the data. The next, we found that the duration of the depression phase, or the duration it takes to close the eye, is significantly shorter and therefore faster in mechanically induced blink re blinks in comparison to spontaneous blinks. And these spontaneous blinks are the ones that we recorded for the kinematics that you saw at the previous part of this talk. 
And we found that, yeah, again, the duration of the depression phase or the duration it takes to close the eye is significantly shorter in these mechanically induced blinks. And in humans, we see a very similar trend. If we look on the, the y-axis on the plots on the left, the y-axis represents duration. And the left plot represents spontaneous, and the right plot represents reflexive blinks. And you can see that the duration of the eye closure period decreases slightly during reflexive compared to spontaneous blinks in humans. And velocity is also greater, which you can see in the second set of plots, the y-axis in the second set of plots representing velocity. And again, spontaneous is on the left, and reflexive is on the right. So combined with the high likelihood that the fully aquatic relatives of the mudskipper have not evolved any sort of eye retraction given their anatomy, we can now suggest that this represents the evolution of a novel reflex. So we can now also support our third hypothesis that another function of blinking in mudskippers is to protect the eye, which has likely occurred through the evolution of a novel reflex loop. And we could talk more about that later if anybody has any questions. So by studying this extraordinary behavior in a system where it is convergently and independently evolved, I think we could start to make some hypotheses of the different ways this behavior could have originated 365 million years ago when early tetrapods were making their first forays out of water and starting to invade the terrestrial ecosystem for the first time. The first thing we demonstrated is that a complex behavior can evolve in systems with rudimentary morphology. This suggests that few morphological changes or specializations were needed to occur for this behavior to actually evolve in early tetrapods, and that the origination of this behavior could have occurred through a simple eye retraction mechanism, similar to what we see in mudskippers. And that's because most reconstructions of early tetrapods find that the orbit for the eye is located on the dorsal surface of the skull, which is often a really flat-shaped skull, similar to what we think about in alligators. Next, it demonstrates that it's possible for multiple functions to evolve through the evolution of a single behavior. Multiple functions to evolve through the evolution of a single behavior. In mudskippers, we saw three totally distinct functions that are being performed with great efficiency by deploying the exact same behavior and by using the same associated morphology and neural control across all three of these functions. This suggests that it's possible for multiple functions to evolve as a suite rather than as a stepwise process, and that multiple independent selective pressures for different functions can simultaneously drive the evolution of a single multifunctional behavior. And because of that, that's why I think that this relatively complex behavior can evolve independently and repeatedly in lineages that are separated by many millions of years. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody in the Sponberg Lab, the Schubin Lab at the University of Chicago, the Bommel Lab here at Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech Animal Care Team. Thank you, Dr. Hunt, for the organization. And thank you all for being an incredible audience. I appreciate it. I'm happy to take any questions. You can do one or two questions. Yeah, um, really cool stuff. Um, one thing I'm just wondering, in the beginning you talked about blinking evolving once or twice a small number of times, but if it's so easy for it to evolve, would you sort of question that? And the, you know, the idea is that, you know, what if you have species that go from an aquatic environment to terrestrial and then over millions of years sort of go back and forth? The idea is that if it, it seems from a physiological standpoint, it's pretty easy to evolve. And so does that make you think that maybe this is something where there's not just a single origin, but it could be many, many different times? So, great, great question. So across vertebrates, it has originated multiple times. We, we know that it's originated independently in mudskippers. We know that it's evolved at least two or three times in sharks. And in tetrapods, there has only been one transition from water to land. And therefore, we think that, along with all the other evidence of it only being lost in extant species that have regained fully aquatic lifestyles, suggests that it has only evolved a single time in tetrapods. So all the tetrapods we see on land, we believe that that is just a single origin for that, 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 that reason and those multiple lines of evidence that we went through. But it is, it is this evolvable behavior, right? We do see it multiple times in these other aquatic systems, which really drives the point that blinking doesn't just function to wet the eye. 
it's also a very important function or behavior for, for protecting the eye and things like that. Yeah, but great question, thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, so is there any variability in the depth of eye depression depending on the function of the blink? Because I think this is a really interesting difference between humans and a lot of other animals. They, because they depress, it's almost like they depress and they blink. Whereas, because there's a film covering it as well, so the depression is interesting. <laughs> Yeah, so you're, you're, you're asking, is there, is there any variability in how far they depress that, that, that in, during a blink? Yeah, so in our data for the spontaneous blinks, we saw a highly consistent depression, um, depression amplitude. And we also saw that exact same uh, depression amplitude in all of our mechanically stimulated blinks. Um, so we know that at least in those two functions, it is about the same amount of, 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 of depression distance. We didn't calculate the depression in the clean, but given the removal of all of the debris from the eye surface, it also suggests that it is a completely full blink all the way down. We think that it's actually a passive mechanism that raises the eye back up out of the skull because in a cadaver, I'm actually able to depress the eye fully and then it's able to spring back up. So it feels like it, 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 it's almost this bistable system where you're either down or you're up, and it's very hard to lay yourself in between these two points. Great question, thank you. We're, uh, maybe we can do one more quick question, and that's it. Going back to the evolution, I was just curious if, you, if there's anything known about or if you would have any predictions about blinking in uh, mammals that have transitioned back to water. Like yeah, great mammals, question. Like, like, like say what was the last part? Dolphins, whales, hippos, or things like that. Yeah, I, we don't have a lot of data on, on those particular species, those, those fully aquatic mammals, but mammals like, um, like beavers, for example, and other semi-aquatic mammals that are going in and out of terrestrial and aquatic environments, they've evolved that third nictitating membrane where they actually, it's this third membrane that goes like this across the eyes, and it's that translucent membrane. So they can continue to see. So when I think about these semi-aquatic mammals, I always tell people they've actually evolved like a set of goggles for themselves so that they're able to, to keep their eyes really clean when underwater, but maintain that visual acuity. But yeah, we don't actually know a lot about the, the dolphins and whales. It's, a, it's an interesting group to look at, yeah. Thank you, everybody.